So, good afternoon, my dear fellow Pythonistas. Um, my warmest welcome as I present my talk entitled What I Learned from 300 Plus Fantastic Young People or 360 Amazing Young People About Python. Now, as the previous academic year began, I found myself enthrusted with the task of introducing computing and coding to a cohort of 360 young people aged 11 to 14. But the challenge was quite significant in that this institution had no prior history of coding or computer science, and it was a blank canvas. So I was determined to build a firm foundation and foster a thriving environment for the growth of these young people. And I decided that the young people should begin this journey with the textual program language, Python. So in this talk, I'm going to share with you the remarkable insights I gained from working with this great cohort of 360 young people and how their teachings, note, not their teachings, not my teachings, transformed my perspective on coding. So, to lay the groundwork, we needed to construct the infrastructure required to support their learning journey in Python, and we needed a suitable IDE. Now, obviously, one of the facets of this IDE was that this Python module should support, Python was this environment, rather, should support the core modules of Python. But also, I wanted it such that it would support more advanced modules, such as matplotlib, so they could draw graphs, and things like um, web scraping modules also. And there was a second feature that's very important from an educator, and that is that you want a system which you can easily deploy and conveniently roll out programming exercises to a large group of people, 360 in this case. And the idea is that you write the programming exercises once, you roll them out simultaneously to everyone, and the students then work on the exercises. And also in this system, the educator should be easily be able to view and modify the student's code. Now, it's going to come as a surprise, probably to you and to me, that these systems are actually relatively uncommon commercially. In fact, it is like finding a needle in a haystack. So after a great deal of painstaking research and Googling, I discovered a US-based company called Coding Rooms, which has since been taken over, which appeared to provide this functionality. And then I, along with some IT colleagues, went on webinars, seminars, transatlantic conference calls on how to actually use and set up this software. We were all ready to go after a few weeks. Secondly, we needed an effective way, an efficient way of developing and marking termly tests and recording the scores. And with such large numbers of people involved, we needed to actually automate this or automate it as much as possible. And for that, I discovered Google Classroom with its Google's forms, quizzes and spreadsheets. So we had to spend a considerable amount of time sourcing, setting up, conducting research with regards to creating the infrastructure for a proper learning environment. Now, with this stage set, we embarked on a meticulously crafted scheme of work that enabled, that blended both a top-down and traditional bottom-up approach. And the approach ensured that the students could master the fundamental concepts of programming whilst gradually expanding their knowledge and skills. So we began with starter programs, which demonstrated how coding room system would work, how to create simple working programs in its editor, how to run these programs, how to study the output of these programs, and how, more importantly, not to be disarmed with errors. And for this purpose, we wrote programs which involved addition, subtraction, multiplication of numbers. And we used memorable names such as apples and bananas for variables. And remember, we're dealing with people as young as 11 and 12. And these programs proved quite popular. Next, we introduced the concept of modern div, with examples of eliciting whether a number was odd or even, or if a number was divisible by another number. Now, these programs also proved popular, but we began to realize that these students were not used to the idea of remainder, as they were always using the calculator, which gave decimal points. 
We then went on to control structures with the selection if and iteration for and while. And as the confidence of these young people grew, we delved deeper into coding by teaching the young people about functions and we introduced them to libraries such as Random and Matplotlib. Now, to my astonishment, I discovered that I was learning just as much from my young charges as they were learning from me. Actually, I was learning more. And their fresh perspectives and their unique insights really opened my eyes to the elegance and power of this Python programming language. So one such enlightening moment came when we explored the for loop. Now, as I introduced this concept, I couldn't help feel but a mixture of excitement, apprehension, trepidation. How on earth were they going to understand this complex concept, or rather complex from my point of view, as I discovered later? So we just started with two lines of code that generated consecutive numbers. For j in range 1,5, print j. What is the output? 1, 2, 3, 4, a young student answered in an animated fashion. I explained how it was working. The first value of j is 1, you print 1. The second value of j is 2, you print 2. The third value is 3, you print 3. And the fourth value is 4, and you print 4. And you don't go up to the 5. And then I asked the young children or the young, young people, do you understand? Now, to my surprise, all 24 young students in the class nodded in unison and quite happily. Then we changed the number. 5 to 10. So we got 4J in range 1, 10, print J. And this gave, what did it give? I asked them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. They replied happily. And then I changed it to 100. So we got 4J in range 1, 100, print J. And what do you get here? The numbers 1 to 99. They clamoured excitedly in unison. And these students were immediately captivated by the simplicity and power of these lines. And with a sense of wonderment, they noticed and they commented on how just two lines of code could possibly produce tens, thousands, hundreds, millions of lines of output. And one student, hitherto unimpressed by all this coding, even whispered under her breath, very interesting. Now, it was during this discussion that a student posed a thought-provoking question. Could we generate an infinite number of lines? Now, this query caught me off guard, and I had to pause and reflect. Although theoretically possible, I explained, we lacked a symbol to represent infinity. And this interaction revealed to me the true essence and potential of the for loop, a realisation that had previously eluded me. In fact, in this conference, I have come across the generator, and I think you can actually um, manufacture infinite number of lines. So, another transformative experience came with the exploration of the random module. We began by examining the traditional example of randomly selecting a number from a six-sided dice. Import random, r equals random.randin, 1, 6. This generates a random number between 1 and 6. Their faces were quite animated. I like random numbers, said more than one young person. We then discuss probability. What is the probability that the number three will be chosen? What is the probability that the number four will be chosen? One out of six, a group of 11 and 12 year olds clamored. Now to my surprise, even the youngest students, aged just 11, displayed a remarkable degree of comfort with the abstract concept of probability. However, it was one student's question that opened a new door of exploration for all of us. They asked, can we generate decimal numbers? Now, up to that point, we'd only been dealing with integers, as that was the focus of the curriculum in terms of randomness. Intrigued, I delved into research and discovered that the command x equals random dot random would generate a random number between 0 and 1. Excited by this newfound knowledge, we delved further, generating decimal numbers between 1 and 100. Now, interestingly enough, 
the young students were very excited by all of this. And this experience made me realize the importance of presenting a complete picture of what is possible beyond the confines of the curriculum. And the students showed me that true learning goes beyond prescribed boundaries. Another student's fascination with randomness took our discussions to another level. They questioned the very nature of randomness and asked, are computer-generated random numbers truly more random than those generated by machines, such as randomly choosing lottery balls for the weekly lottery draws? This then led the student to create a poster on the concept of randomness and discover an intriguing website on the subject of randomness from MIT. And it was that moment that I realized that my, how much my own understanding had expanded through curiosity and the inquiries of my young learners. As time progressed, the students' hunger for knowledge grew and they began to seek additional challenges. So responding to their enthusiasm, I introduced them to Matplotlib, a powerful library for data visualizations. The students were provided with worked coding examples of drawing straight lines, creating bar charts and pie charts. Now, what really amazed me was how quickly they understood the code, as their ability to re read code was like someone would sight read a piano piece. And whilst a textbook might devote half a page to explaining the interpretation of code, these young minds effortlessly grasped its meaning, and their natural aptitude for exploring beyond the prescribed uh, materials was evident when they went on to discover uh, an online editor that supported Matplotlib. They even extended their exploration to creating line graphs, depicting book preferences in a library of their favorite subjects. There is their graph and code and pie charts on farm animals. And the breadth of their imagination and the speed at which they assimilated these new concepts amazed me. Now, to put it into perspective, a student mentioned that their uncle, working in the meteorological office, the branch of science forecasting the weather, was only just learning about these things. Of course, to be fair, it is a relatively new area of coding. And it's a testament to the power of exposure and the drive of these young people how they explore uncharted territories of knowledge. Then I asked them, what is your favorite aspect of coding? Let's explore some of their answers. There were answers related to the endless possibilities of coding. You can make the computer do or show you anything you want, which is fun, said Maria, aged 11. My favorite thing about coding is learning about all the possibilities that comes with coding, said Lola, age 13, echoing the sentiment. Some students enjoyed fixing errors, getting the results and fixing your errors, Yasmin, aged 12. Now, surprisingly, a number of students found joy in dealing with errors, a concept that I had always thought a necessary pain. And so this, these comments, they shed a unique perspective. Some young students enjoyed the certainty of outcome. I enjoy the complexity of the codes and the reassurance that there will always be a correct output to the coding program, said Amelia, age 13. And, and we continue. And some young students enjoyed the mathematical aspects, solving equations, said Ellen at age 13. Now, the mathematical aspects of coding, often feared by some, became a source of fascination for many. My favorite thing about coding is learning how to add on to simple equations to make them more complex and advanced, Cecily, age 13. Now, some enjoyed the learning aspect, being able to try out and experiment with new things that I wouldn't be able to do at home or in my free time, said Lara, age 14. And others were amazed by the huge power of these coding languages. It is very complicated, but interesting. Who knew a few words and numbers could make today's technology, said Hannah, age 13. And indeed, 
you know, if you think about it, these programming languages are quite small in terms of their vocabulary um, with respect to sort of human languages. And it's amazing how much, you know, small vocabulary can do. So, general learnings. Throughout this journey, I have learned that often all it takes is an introduction to ignite the spark of curiosity within individuals. And once their minds are open to the possibilities, they are eager to forge their own paths of exploration and discovery. And the benefits of introducing coding at such a young age are manifold. Not only do young learners have the freedom to explore and experiment, and remember, they don't have an upcoming external ex examination imminently, so this gives them a lot of freedom to experiment. But they also develop a deep appreciation for the beauty and the versatility of coding. And their experience of has reinforced the notion that a few lines of code can create an abundance of possibilities and that satisfaction arises when things fall into place. Now you may be wondering, do we have any concrete data to support the effectiveness of this approach? I present you a table illustrating the percentage of students interested in pursuing computer science as a GCSE subject. This is the external examinations we take in the UK at age 16, and this cr has a lot of coding within it. And surprisingly, the numbers speak for themselves, highlighting the profound impact this experience had on their aspirations. So out of the 198 students that have currently responded, 125 said yes, or maybe, so currently registering a 63% interest. And as I conclude this talk, I am reminded of a profound quote by Plato, 6th century famous philosopher, do not train children in learning by force and harshness, but direct them to it by what amuses their minds, so that you may be better able to discover with accuracy the peculiar bent of the genius of each. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Lillian. This was super insightful. So if you have any question, kindly move to the microphone and Lillian will answer. Well, first of all, thank you um, for the talk as well as for teaching well, the next generation. Um, I was very intrigued by what you said. I think it was about the diet, um, about always giving the full picture. Something I seem to struggle on the opposite end by being over comprehensive in my answers when educating people. So I always find it a bit difficult and would like to profit from your experiences. Um, when asked a question, usually, especially young people or people just starting their journey, they have a very specific question in mind and ask a very specific topic. And I, have, I notice I have a tendency to give a very comprehensive answer that may answer their question, but also questions they actually haven't answered because I feel that I would be sort of a miss if I would be too simplistic. So I find it a bit difficult, is what I'm saying, to um, narrow down the level, the level of detail to what my, the person asking needs. So when you said, always give the full picture <coughs> and don't stick to the original plan or to what the constraints originally were, um, that seems to go in the other direction. So did, how, do you, how, do, how do you strike the balance is, I think, my question. Oh, you're saying how do you tackle their questions and what level of detail yes, you give yes. and how broad you give. I mean, I think if you know, you should tackle their question and give them the level of detail, uh, you know, answer their question directly yeah. and give them the, um, that depth of the answer. And then I think um, it's worth actually br um, broadening your answer as well and giving them a broad picture as well so that they have an idea of how the specific thing that they've asked fits in a wider context. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. So I have a question. What tools are you using when, when, when you are teaching the kids? So 
for example, you ask them to install the Python interpreter and I don't know, what, are you using some IDE for, for writing code with, with them? So okay. what applications uh, kids are using? Okay, so last year I discovered this um, IDE called Coding Rooms, which was specially developed for the purpose of um, teaching, actually. And it was being used in American universities and uh, some American schools. Now, this, this piece of... this um, Unfortunately, this um, software or this rather company has been taken over. So this coding rooms, kind of we installed it on, you know, centrally, to be honest. We installed it centrally, and, so, and each um, desktop kind of got a copy. And on this coding room, it had lots of editors, or, you know, you can do lots of programming languages on it, including Python. And you could, I mean, it was a, it's, it's a beautiful piece of software, really. You could, so, you know, we set it up, so you had 15 classes, so, um, you know, I set up 15 classes with the students' names on it, kind of thing, and um, all I needed to do is to write this, uh, you know, write the program in exercises once, publish um, in a notebook, publish the notebook, and the students would go on to the system and they could see it. Um, it's a beautiful piece of software. I don't know if it's going to be continued or not, but I'd dearly like it to be because I don't think there is anything else like it on the market. Okay, coding yeah. rooms. You, coding rooms. Only available for the next year, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, how would you recommend taking children to this journey of learning coding um, in a non-speaking English um, area of the world? I mean, my sister can, can't really understand English. So if I want to teach her Python, for example, that's a no-go. Because the idea of for loop or in or even the word apple will mean anything to you. So. What would you recommend about it? I mean, it, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a, it's a language, you know, so in the same way that you learn somebody, say, say, I don't know, who's, say, a native English speaker is learning Spanish uh, and to sort of adopt the same approach as, as if you're learning a new human language, really. But I feel that there are like two steps here. She needs to understand English and coding, and maybe it's like taking over the purpose of her le learning coding, because we are forcing her to learn English on the way. I don't know. Yeah. You're saying you're forcing her to learn English on the way. I, I, I don't know if there's a way actually ar ar around it, really. OK. Yeah. OK, thank you. Hiya, Th thanks for your talk. Uh, my question comes from a, a naive um, standpoint because I haven't done any Python education yet, but uh, increasingly I feel, yeah, the desire to try and give some, some kids the, the opportunities I, I, I didn't get at, at that age, 11 to 14. Um, but my question is, um, you know, as a professional programmer, I think I would really struggle to know how to pitch it, where to pitch it. And in your experience, were you more... Um, inclined to overpitch it, i.e. go into too much detail too quickly, or did you find you had to speed up um, because the kids took you by surprise and they, they understood more, more quickly than you expected? In, yeah, particularly at 11 to 14. I mean, I didn't... How can I put this? I haven't made any concessions for them just because they're 11 to 14. D sure. does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, in, in the sense that, by, by way of pitching, you know, we, start, we started off with um, adding numbers, apples equals 10, bananas equals 12, total equals apples plus bananas. And I think by ways of pitching, th because they're so young, they have the advantage of being doing lots and lots of examples. So it's not so much... Pitching, it's what we do, but 
they, but they, they're doing lots and lots of those examples. So in the, in the same way that you would, they would learn maths, for example, where they have lots of worked examples, I'm giving them lots of worked examples of what we do. Does that make any sense? Yeah. It's more the, the time allocated to something yeah, rather pacing. than the That's actual material word. itself. Yeah, maybe pacing was a better word. Did you need to go faster or slower than you, you first expected? Um, oh, you, you hit it just right. <laughs> faster or slower? Um, Probably faster. Yeah. They, they, they grasp things very, very quickly, uh, incredibly quickly. You, um, it's very surprising. So, you know, I, um, through, through, through the year, we started in September, I didn't know how far we'd actually get with the coding. We've got far f f further than, we, uh, than I actually anticipated. That's great. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. I have a question about uh, even younger children trying to teach them uh, things like Python. And when I think about teaching program to very young children, I often think about the, uh, how you might do it in like a visual way, like with visual elements rather than textual code. And I was curious with the setup you had and maybe then other functions or something, um, what younger age would you have been comfortable with teaching as well? Um, okay. I. I mean, this is 11 to 14. Um, I have, I did have a 10-year-old um, student online as well, and he was, he is the best. Uh, and I was experimenting with him to see how far I could go, and can I teach him exactly what I'm teaching these people? Um, no problem whatsoever, actually. And. And I think you can go, I have tried with a couple of eight-year-olds as well. Um, I mean, I, I only did one lesson with them and they were adding and subtracting, no problem whatsoever. Um, I think children, they're used to processing text because they read a lot and they're used to processing text with maths and things. So I don't think, you know, so th this is just an extension of what they already do. And I think, I think you can um, actually introduce it at age eight. I'd like to, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so another question about platforms. I would like to ask, did you ever consider using uh, something called NB Grader is an extension to Jupyter Notebooks, which you can use in classrooms for like, teaching oh. and grading. Sorry, what is it called? NB Grader. Oh, NB Grader. I have, I have heard of it. Um, well, I I think I might have considered it at one stage, but I wanted a. I wanted something which you could actually buy in and install just like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And which is commercially supported. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Sure. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll end here. Thank you, Lillian, and thank you all for joining.